Year 6, I hope you are all well and you are staying safe. My name is Miss Daisy and I am one of the people in charge of the maths department here at Ormiston Horizon. You will see me in your maths lessons when you arrive at the academy and if you're really lucky I might even be your maths teacher. Okay, so I'm going to be reading chapter 12 of Stormbreaker to you today. It's called Behind the Door. Alex swam forward slowly, completely blind, afraid that at any moment he would crack his head against rock. Despite the dry suit, he had long ago felt the chill of the water and knew that he had to find his way onto dry land soon. His hand brushed against something, but his fingers were too numb to tell what it was. He reached out and pulled himself forward. His feet touched the bottom, and it was then that he realised he could see. Somehow, from somewhere, light was seeping into the area beyond the submerged tunnel. Slowly, his vision adjusted itself, waving his hand in front of his face. He could just about make out his fingers. He was holding onto a wooden beam, a collapsed roof support. He had closed his eyes and opened them again. The darkness had retreated, showing him a crossroads cut into the rock, the meeting place of three tunnels. The fourth, behind him, was the one that was flooded. As vague as the light was, it gave him strength. Using the beam as a makeshift jetty, he clambered onto the rock. At the same time, he became aware of the soft throbbing sound. He couldn't be sure if it was near or far, but he remembered what he had heard under Block D, in front of the metal door, and he knew that he had arrived. He stripped off the dry suit. It had served him well. The main part of his body was dry, even though ice-cold water dripped out of his hair and down his neck. His shoes and socks were sodden. When he moved forward, his feet squelched and he had to take off his shoes and shake them out before he could go on. Ian Ryder's map was still folded in his pocket, but he no longer had any need of it. All he had to do was follow the light. He went straight forward to another intersection, then turned right. The light was so bright now that he could actually make out the colour of the rock, dark brown and grey. The throbbing was also getting louder, and Alex could feel a rush of cool air streaming down toward him. He moved forward cautiously, wondering what he was about to come to. He turned a corner and suddenly the rock on both sides gave way to new brick, with metal grills set at intervals just above the level of the floor. The old mine shaft had been converted. It was being used as the outlet for some sort of air conditioning system. The light that had guided Alex here was coming out of the grills. He knelt beside the first of these and looked through into the large, white, tiled room. A laboratory with complicated glass and steel equipment laid out over work surfaces. The room was empty. Tentatively, Alex took hold of the grill, but it was firmly secured, bolted onto the rock face. The second grill belonged to the same room. It was also screwed in tight. Alex continued up the tunnel to a third grill. This one looked, like, looked into a storage room filled with the silver boxes that Alex had seen being delivered by the submarine the night before. He took the grill in both hands and pulled. It came away from the wall easily, and looking closer, he understood why. Once again, Ian Ryder had been here ahead of him. He had cut through the bolts holding it in place. Alex set down the grill silently, glad that he had found the strength to go forward. Carefully, he squeezed through the rectangular hole in the wall and into the room. At the last minute, lying on his stomach with his feet dangling below, he reached for the grill and set it back in place. Provided nobody looked too closely, they wouldn't see anything wrong. The ground was a long way away, at least twice his own height, but that wasn't going to stop him now. He dropped down and landed cat-like on the balls of his feet. The throbbing was louder, coming from somewhere outside. It would cover any noise he made. He went over to the nearest of the silver boxes and examined it. He found two catches on the lid and pressed. The box clicked open in his hands, but when he looked inside, it was empty. Whatever had been delivered was already in use. He checked for cameras, found none, then crossed to the door. It was unlocked. He opened it, one inch at a time, and peered out. The door led onto a wide corridor with an automatic sliding door at each end and a silver rail running its full length. 1900 hours, red shift to assembly line, blue shift to decontamination. The voice rang out over a loudspeaker system, neither male nor female, emotionless, inhuman. Alex glanced at his watch. It was already seven o'clock in the evening. It had taken him longer than he had thought to get through the mine. He stole forward. It wasn't exactly a passage that he had found, it was more of an observation platform. 
he reached the rail and looked down. Alex hadn't any idea where he would find behind the metal door, but what he was seeing now was far beyond anything he could have imagined. It was a huge chamber, the walls half naked rock, half polished, steel lined with computer equipment, electronic meters, and machines that blinked and flickered with a life of their own. It was staffed by 40 or 50 people, some in white coats, others in overalls, all wearing armbands of different colours. Red, yellow, blue and green. Arc lights beamed down from above. Armed guards stood at each doorway, watching the work with blank faces. For this was where the Stormbreakers were being assembled. The computers were being slowly carried in, a long continuous line along a conveyor belt, past the various scientists and technicians. The strange thing was that they looked already finished. And of course they had to be. Sale told him. They were actually being shipped out during the course of the afternoon and night. So what last minute adjustment was being made here in the secret factory? And why was so much of the production line hidden away? What Alex had seen as he crept around Sale Enterprises had only been the tip of the iceberg. The main body of the factory was here, underground. He looked more closely. He remembered the Stormbreaker that he had used. And now he noticed something that he hadn't seen then. A strip of plastic had been drawn back in the casing above each of the screens to reveal a small component, cylindrical and about five inches deep. The computers were passing underneath a bizarre machine, cantilevers, wires and hydraulic arms. Opaque silver test tubes were being fed along a narrow cage. Moving forward as if to greet the computers, one tube for each computer, there was a meeting point. With infinite precision, the tubes were lifted out brought around and then dropped into the exposed compartments. After that, the storm breakers were accelerated forward. A second machine closed and heat sealed the plastic strip. By the time the computers reached the end of the line, where they were packed into the red and white sail enterprises boxes, the compartments were completely invisible. A movement caught his eye and Alex looked along the assembly line and through a huge window into the chamber next door. Two men in spacesuits were walking clumsily together as if in slow motion. They stopped. An alarm began to sound and suddenly they disappeared in a cloud of white steam. Alex remembered what he had just heard. Were they being de decontaminated? But if the Stormbreakers were based on the round processor, there couldn't possibly be any need for such extremes. And anyway, this was nothing like Alex had ever seen before. If the men were being decontaminated, what were they being decontaminated from? Agent Grigorovich, report to the biocontainment zone. This is a call for Agent Grigorovich. A lean, fair-haired figure, dressed in black, detached himself from the assembly line and walked languidly toward a door that slid open to receive him. For the second time, Alex found himself looking at the Russian contract killer, Yasen Grigorovich. What was going on? Alex thought back to the submarine and the vacuum seal boxes. Of course! Yasin had brought the test tubes that were even now being inserted into the computers. The test tubes were some sort of weapon that he was using to sabotage them. No, that wasn't possible. Back in Port Talon, the librarian had told him that Ian Ryder had been asking for books about computer viruses. Viruses? Decontamination? The biocontainment zone? Understanding came, and with it something cold and solid jabbing in the back of his neck. Alex hadn't even heard the door open behind him, but he slowly straightened up as a voice so spoke softly into his ear. Stand up, keep your hands by your sides. If you make any sudden move, I'll shoot you in the head. He looked around slowly. A single guard stood behind him, a gun in his hand. It was the sort of thing that Alex had seen a thousand times in films and on television and he was shocked by how different the reality was. The gun was a browning automatic pistol, and one twitch of the man's finger would send a 9mm bullet shattering through his skull and into his brain. The very thought of it made him feel sick. He stood up. The guard was in his twenties, pale-faced and puzzled. Alex had never seen him before, but more importantly, he had never seen Alex. He hadn't expected to come across a boy. That might help. Who are you, he asked. What are you doing here? I'm staying with Mr Sale, Alex said. He stared at the gun. 
Why are you pointing that at me? I'm not doing anything wrong. He sounded pathetic. Little boy lost, but it had the desired effect. The guard hesitated, slightly lowering the gun, and at that moment Alex struck. It was another classic karate blow, this time twisting his body around and driving his elbow into the side of the man's head, just below his ear. The guard didn't even cry out. His eyes rolled and he went limp. Alex had almost certainly knocked him out with a single punch, but he couldn't take chances and followed it through with a knee into the groin. The guard folded, his pistol falling to the ground. Quickly, Alex dragged him, dragged him back away from the railings. He looked down. Nobody had seen what had happened. But the guard wouldn't be unconscious long, and Alex knew he had to get out of here. Not just back up to the ground level, but out of sale enterprises altogether. He had to contact Mrs Jones. He still didn't know how or why, but he knew now that the Stormbreakers had been turned into killing machines. There were less than 24 hours until the launch at the Science mu Museum. Somehow, Alex had to stop it from happening. He ran. The door at the end of the passage slid open and he found himself in a curving white corridor with windowless offices built into what, yet, into what must yet be more shafts of the Dosmery Mine. He knew he couldn't go back the way he came. He was too tired. And even if he could get find his way through the mine, he'd never be able to swim, manage to swim a second time. His only chance was the door that, led him, that had led him here first. It led to the metal staircase that would bring him to Block D. There was a telephone in his room. Failing that, he could use the Game Boy to transmit a message. But MI6 had to know what he had found out. He reached the end of the corridor, then ducked back as three guards appeared, walking together th toward a set of double doors. Fortunately, they hadn't seen him. Nobody knew he was there. He was going to be all right. And then the alarms went off. A siren wailing electronically along the corridors, leaping out from the corners, echoing everywhere. Overhead, a light began to flash red. The guards wheeled around and saw Alex. Unlike the man on the observation platform, they didn't hesitate. As Alex leaped forward head first into the front into the door, they brought up their machine guns and fired. Bullets slammed into the wall beside him and ricocheted along the passageway. Alex landed flat on his stomach and kicked out, slamming the door behind him. He straightened up, found a bolt and rammed it home. A second later, there was an explosive hammering on the other side as the guards, fi guards fired at the door. But it was solid metal. It holed. Alex was standing in the metal passageway leading to a tangle of pipes and cylinders, like the boiler room of a ship. The alarm was as loud here as it had been in the main chamber. It seemed to be coming from everywhere. He leaped down the staircase three steps at a time and skidded to a halt, searching for a way out. He had the choice of three corridors. Then he heard the rattle of feet and knew that his choice had just begun to. He wished now that he had thought to pick up the Browning automatic. He was alone and unarmed, the only duck in a shooting gallery with guns everywhere and no way out. Was this what MI6 had trained him for? If so, two weeks hadn't been enough. He ran on, weaving in and out of the pipes, trying every door he came to, a room with more spacesuits hanging on hooks, a shower room, another larger laboratory with a second door leading out, and in the middle, a glass tank shaped like a barrel filled with green liquid. Tangles of rubber tubing sprouted out of the tank, trays filled with test tubes all around. <clears throat> <coughs> Excuse me. The barrel shaped tank, the trays, Alex had seen them before as vague outlines on his Game Boy. He must have been standing on the other side of the second door. He ran over to it. It was locked from the inside, electronically, with a glass plate against the wall. He would never be able to open it. He was trapped. Footsteps approached and Alex just had time to hide himself on the floor. Underneath one of the work surfaces before the first door was thrown open and two more guards ran into the laboratory. They took a quick look around without seeing him. Not here, one of them said. You'd better go up. One guard walked out the way he had come. The other went over to the door and placed his hand on the glass identification panel. There was a green glow and the door buzzed loudly. The guard threw it open and disappeared. Alex rolled forward as the door swung shut and just managed to get his hand into the crack. He waited a moment, then stood up. He opened the door 
and as he had hoped, he was looking out into the unfinished passageway where he had been surprised by Nardi of old. The guard had already gone on ahead. Alex slipped out, closing the door behind him, cutting off the sound of the siren. He made his way up the metal stairs. They led him back to the glass corridor that joined block C and D. Alex was grateful to be back above ground. He found a door and slipped outside. The sun had already set. But across the lawn, the airstrip was ablaze, artificially illuminated by the sorts of light Alex had seen in soccer stadiums. There were about a dozen trucks parked next to each other. Men were loading them up with heavy, square, red and white boxes. The cargo plane that Alex had seen when he arrived rumbled down the runway and lurched into the air. Alex knew that he was looking at the end of the assembly line. The red and white boxes were the same ones he had seen in the underground chamber. The Stormbreakers, complete with their deadly secret, were being loaded up and delivered. By morning, they would be all over the country. Keeping low, he ran past the fountain and across the grass. He thought about making for the main gate, but knew that it was hopeless. The guards would have been alerted. They'd be waiting for him. Nor could he climb the perimeter fence, not with the razor wire stretched out across the top. No. His own room seemed the best answer. The telephone was there, and so were his only weapons. The few gadgets that Smithers had given him four days ago. Or was it four years ago? He entered the house through the kitchen, the same way he had left on the night before. It was only eight o'clock, but the whole place seemed to be deserted. He ran up the staircase and along the corridor to his room on the first floor. Slowly, he opened the door. It seemed his luck was holding out. There was nobody there. Without turning on the light, he went inside and snatched up the telephone. The line was dead. Never mind. He found the cartridges for his Game Boy, his Yo-Yo and the Zip Cream and crammed them into his pockets. He had already decided not to stay here. It was too dangerous. He would find somewhere to hide out. Then he would use the Nemesis cartridge to contact MI6. He went back to the door and opened it. With a shock, he saw Mr Grin standing in the hallway, looking hideous with his white face, his ginger hair and his morphed twisted smile. Alex reacted quickly, striking out with the heel of his right hand. But Mr Grin was quicker. He ducked to one side, then his hand shot out, the side of it driving into Alex's throat. Alex gasped for breath, but none came. The butler made an inarticulate sound and lashed out a second time. Alex got the impression that behind the livid scars he was really grinning, enjoying himself. He tried to avoid the blow, but Mr Grin's fist hit him square on the jaw. He was spun into the bedroom, falling backward. He never even remembered hitting the floor. Okay, Year 6, that is the end of Chapter 12, so you need to get your workbooks now and complete the questions. The next teacher will read you chapter 13. Hopefully see you soon. Bye.